Welcome to another show of this week. Our first story highlights a speech by South Sudan's President Savakir as he addresses the Transitional National Legislative Assembly for the first time. Here are the highlights. President Savakir has said that the Transitional Government of National Unity is ready to work with regional and international partners involved in the peace process. This assembly is a very important institution and it has a lot to deliver in the context of the agreement on the resolution of the conflict in South Sudan. You will not achieve what the people of South Sudan expect of you if you do not work together and support its new leadership. Therefore, I call upon you all, honorable members, to tolerate each other and cooperate amongst yourselves so that you do what is expected of you in the coming months. President Kiir was speaking on Monday, August 15th, at the inauguration of the Transitional National Legislative Assembly, where he said the government has not announced its objection to a resolution adopted by the UN Security Council for the deployment of a 4,000 strong protection force in Juba. He said the government is ready to dialogue with the United Nations and other partners. Already there are people who are accusing the Tigono of refusing and fighting the UN. I want to confirm on this great day that this is not, this is not uh, an accurate appraisal of our position. The Tigono has not met to, 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 to play on the final position. The deliberations will come later on. Uh, final position taken by the UN Security Council. If there are voices outside there expressing their view on the subject, these are individuals. who do not necessarily represent the Tigono and have certainly not been mandated to speak on behalf of the transitional government of national unity. On reports of sexual abuse, the president said investigations are underway and the culprit will be held accountable. There have been allegations and reports of various cases of sexual, sexual assault. This is a very serious matter. I would like I would like to unequivocally stress that we still show zero tolerance we will, we will show zero tolerance towards such incidences. We have already begun an initial investigation and we are reviewing medical reports and intend to prosecute those who will be found involved in this crime. President Kidd also said he understood the concerns regarding the safety and the well-being of NGO staff, aid and medical agencies and displaced South Sudanese in camps, adding that he had instructed all ministers in the security sector and the interior ministry to create a safe environment throughout the country. I want them to create a safe environment throughout the country that would make it uh, will make their, their movement and activities un, unthreatened and uninterrupted. They are here to help us. And it is our practical responsibility and moral duty to make sure that they are safe.
The Security Council adopted a resolution on August 12th to deploy Regional Protection Force to the South Sudan capital. In our humanitarian story this week, we follow the relocation of those who were displaced early July. Their move from one UN compound to another saw women, children and men packing the little they own. Some 1,000 internally displaced persons have been moved to new, cleaner and drier accommodations in South Sudan, said Sam Mohamure officer in charge of Relief, Reintegration and Protection Section. Lack of proper sanitation, congestion and poorly constructed housing were just some of the issues that IDPs dealt with in the Transit Protection of Civilians area in Juba, Tongping. The Tongping was just a transit site because people had to come at the height of the violence, but there is area where Unimis is able to provide protection to them, said Sam Mohamore. We have to make sure that it's voluntary, it's dignified, and it happens in a way that helps to protect the safety and security of the people. Let's remember that primarily they are here for protection. And uh, tomping is not meant to be really a POC, no. Tomping uh, was just uh, a transit site because people had to come in at the height of the violence, but the area where UNMIS is able to provide protection to them is POC in UN House, POC 1 and POC 3. The Tongpin area is a swampy area, flood, and with the cholera outbreak, the risk is high compared to the UN House Protection of Civilian Side, which has health and education facilities, along with improved water, wash, drainage and sanitation, added Mohamore. As you know, there is an outbreak of cholera in uh, Juba. And if you see this stomping area, it is a swampy area and uh, it's prone to flooding. And it, that makes the risk of serious disease outbreak very high. As you recall, in 2014, we had about 20,000 IDPs here. So we had to take them to UN House POC3. And the whole argument is that in the UN House, it's a well-designed and planned protection site that can uh, address the issue of protection primarily, not only physical protection, but also protection from diseases. Sam stresses out that the IDPs are sitting on the roadside and occupying offices. We must work all of us towards getting out of an emergency kind of environment. Because this was not meant to be a POC site, they are now sitting on the roads, as you can see. That's not healthy for them. They are sitting in the offices, occupying the offices of uh, Rwanda Battalion. We also need to operate. We must work, all of us, towards getting out of uh, an emergency kind of environment to an organized way of delivering on our mandates. The IOM International Organization for Migration facilitates the transportation of the internally displaced persons from the transit site while the government of South Sudan and Unimis give protection along the road. Around 200 persons were unified with their families in the other side of the protection of civilian side, said Hanna Kurwin, Camp Manager, International Organization of Migration. We have had around 200 odd people come to us and say that they have family that side. So we are expecting to reunify more people over the coming days. Um, the projected plan eventually, the idea is to move everybody to the site in Yuan House. Um, we as IOM will be moving everybody who's willing to go, uh, who wants to go to that site. Um, we'll make them aware of the services that are available in the Yuan House POC. Uh, and then those that are willing to go will be registered by us here in the transit site. Uh, and then they'll move in convoy, uh, as these people are doing this morning. Matok is one IDP who is going to a UN house, a protection of civilian, to unify with his family, because when the violence erupted, he was caught up in the town, and he couldn't manage to join his family due to insecurity. My family are there, and that's why now I'm going there. Uh, but the situation for me here, there is no any problem, but the problem is that 
when my brothers and uh, mother, father are there, and then I'm part with them. And this cannot be uh, good for me, because I don't know what is going on there for them. In our next piece, as we commemorate the World Humanitarian Day, which is marked annually on August 19th, by interviewing the UN Humanitarian Coordinator in South Sudan, Ujin Aousu. He shed some light on the humanitarian situation in South Sudan and ends with condemnation of an attack on civilians at a hotel in Juba. I think that incident was despicable, to say the least. I think it was deplorable. Uh, that heinous act, truly de deplorable. And I think all, all people, all of us, partners, government, South Sudanese, international community, should come together to condemn this. Um, I think I can't say this enough. Very deplorable act which needs to be condemned. But importantly, we cannot allow impunity to prevail. And, and I use this opportunity to call upon the government of, of South Sudan to thoroughly investigate uh, this deplorable incident and, and ensure that the perpetrators are brought to justice. We need to have absolute peace in this country. I think the guns need to continue to stay silent where there are silent but importantly, where the guns are not silent, let's all work together to silence the gun today. We need to work together to ensure that the relative peace that exists right now continues to provide opportunities for South Sudanese to truly live a life of prosperity and also live a life indeed of dignity. Following a UN Security Council resolution which was adopted with a decision to deploy a regional force of 4,000 troops, guests on Radio Mirai's Democracy in Action discuss various opposing views. Here is part of the debate. If the force was a regional force that was going to negotiate the terms of their operation with the government of national unity as they did, as they agreed to in Addis Ababa, I would not have a problem with that because it is actually a good thing to do, to invite a neighbor to help you thought your things out, and when they are done, they go back. But under the UN, it is impossible to alter the terms once they come. And obviously they will use a neutrality uh, argument that they cannot cooperate with the government because they are protecting civilians against the government and opposition. So it's impossible for them actually to collaborate with the government. We have seen UNIM is never patrolled together with the, with the government because they don't want to be seen as uh, uh, p taking part in, 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 in the conflict. We have other interventions. The, the Ugandans have been guarding our airport in 2013 here and we, we knew where they were. If you pass there, you can see there are Kubas somewhere in the airport. If you, if you went to Bori, you would have seen them also there in the airport. And they were foreigners. It didn't, it didn't pose any threat on us as long as the issue was to keep peace and to help in bringing peace in the country. So I don't see any difference of the, the force which is coming. They are coming from the same purpose. And if we handle, if we handle them well, it will be the same way we have handled the previous one uh, which are there now. So I don't see, I don't see the, the basis of all this fear which we are trying to, to put across, that it is this and this. We are still experiencing violence. We are still experiencing instability. I don't think uh, there is anything you can do to convince me that you can turn a UN mission into, into a permanent peace in South Sudan. Right. The way for peace in South Sudan is internal. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. I insist on dialogue and cooperation, and let us turn this into positive so that we do not invite any more problem and burning into our country. That is what I insist. Thank you very much, Dr. From Africa's spectacular country of thousands of hills, 
to another African country where the magnificent River Nile flows through. 165 Rwandese aviation personnel have been deployed to keep the peace. Our next story shows one of them taking off into the skies. First Lieutenant Mikuera Clementine Mohora is one among 10 Rwandese female personnel who have been deployed to South Sudan as part of an aviation fleet working for United Nations mission in South Sudan. Clementine is up early today and ready to take off for the skies. She has taken her seat as the second in command and she will be flying this monstrous helicopter into the heartland of South Sudan. I feel happy because I like to fly this machine. Yes, it's my job. I like it. She's very confident. I like the way she handles the aircraft. They have a raw record of accidents in aviation industry. Uh, female uh, use much care about flying. I like it. And she's giving me this confidence. I trust her. Church with numerous tasks aimed at supporting the work of the United Nations mission in South Sudan, which include air patrols and transporting passengers and cargo, the aviation personnel from Rwanda indeed play an integral role at the UN mission in South Sudan. On August 11th, this fourth rotation of the Rwandese aviation contingent was recognized for providing transportation service in South Sudan for the past 11 months. This unit has played a critical role in supporting unmissed operations by enabling troop movements, conducting reconnaissance flights and air patrols, providing medical transportation and administrative and logistic flights. Their bravery and courage was exemplified last year when undertaking a successful operation to rescue 18 unmissed personnel and five UN contractors who were taken hostage in Kaka, Upper Nile. This decoration, in which uniformed personnel receive medals, is traditional in peacekeeping. Peacekeeping medal represents an appreciation and recognition for dedicated service to the United Nations and the country's troops served in. And Rwandan soldiers and police officers have stood side by side with their South Sudanese colleagues in trying to build peace in this young nation. When war broke out in 2013, Rwandese soldiers quickly adapted to UNMISS's new mandate and have been courageously engaged in activities to protect civilians and support the mission's operations. The Sector South Commander Brigadier General Andrew Kagame said the government of Rwanda is committed to peace building in the region. I would like to reiterate the Rwanda government's commitment in the preservation of peace and stability in our country as well as in the eastern regional bloc and all over the world by providing troops and equipment in support of the United Nations peacekeeping mission. It is in this regard that uh, the Rwanda government deployed to, to South Sudan two infantry battalions and this aviation unit that is being decorated today. <laughs> Rwanda has more than 6,000 peacekeepers deployed as military and police peacekeepers in various UN missions around the world, making it the fifth top-ranking contributor to UN peacekeeping and the second in Africa. And with their women taking the reins in different fields back home, more are being urged to join in peacekeeping. We end our show this week with our Voices of Peace segment. Goodbye for now, and we hope you will join us again next week. My hope is that South Sudan 
in a uh, in few months we will will be at peace that uh, no more guns are sounding in the country no more people are running to the bush or to the protection of civilian sites or to another country nobody will get ambushed on the road trying to go about their normal business and that uh, next year will be celebrating the 6th anniversary of South Sudan colorfully and with joy we can come out of the situation uh, and uh, we can work jointly in the spirit of dialogue and with the intention of peace and nothing else uh, South Sudan can get into its feet again and it can become one of the dignified uh, countries in Africa and, uh, and even in the world with a success stories to tell in future like what Rwanda is doing now and uh, like what other countries have done after they have gone uh, through difficult times.